Well, here we are. It is the very final panel of the very final day. I'm smiling, but inside my heart is breaking a little bit and I'm sure yours is too, which is why we have scheduled one of your favorite panels for this slot. It is none other than the future of D&D. &D. This is where we do a deep dive into what is on the way for your favorite role-playing game. We're going to discover what we've got to look forward to, not just this year, but in the years to come. And so, for such an important panel, we need an equally all-star lineup. So please welcome Ray Winninger, Liz Hsu, Chris Perkins and Jeremy Crawford, who I'm sure you all know and love. So fantastic to have you all with me. Thanks, Al. Wonderful to be here. Elf. Super now, excited to talk about all things D&D. <laughs> exactly. This is my favorite panel. I can't wait. It's the one that I just, I stop being a presenter and I start just being an excited D&D fan who's got a secret notebook of questions. <laughs> So I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to get straight to it because I know everybody wants me to pack in as many secrets as I can find out into this panel. So, Ray, I'm going to start off with you because you have hinted before, haven't you, that D&D &D is going to be exploring the multiverse. And obviously, if you watched the Dragons panel yesterday, I might have vaguely mentioned I'm a big fan of the multiverse. So I'm very excited. What can you tell us about that? Yes, well, last and last year's panel, L, you may recall that we uh, we talked about uh, that we had plans to revisit some of D and D's classic settings. I mentioned that there were three of the the old classic uh, D and D settings that are in development in the studio. Uh, we released the first of those this year with Ravenloft. Um, uh, the fans all saw that, I'm sure. Uh, that book did really great uh, and and turned out really well. Uh, I've also since said that next year, uh, the other two settings I was referring to are both coming out next year. So look for the returns of two major classic D&D settings next year. Um, both of those are going to uh, actually be published in formats we've never, uh, we've never really published products in before. Um, so we have very new ways of presenting each of those. We're very, very excited about them. And uh, something new that I can add, I can add a couple of new little, little pieces of information. First of all, next year, um, in addition to those two classic settings that we're going to be uh, revisiting, um, you're gonna get just a little wisp, a little, little peek at a third classic D&D &D setting. So there's like a little cameo appearance from a third setting from D&D's past next year that, that you'll see. And I can also confirm that uh, the following year in 2023, there's yet another classic setting that'll be coming out in 2023. So two, uh, re revisiting two classic settings next year, peak at a third, and then yet another classic setting in 2023. All right, here we go. We're straight in. We're straight in with the exciting <laughs> news, with the hints being dropped. Oh, I can't wait. This is what I was here for. Jeremy, I want to come to you next because it does feel, doesn't it, like we're seeing an evolution of D&D, &D, particularly over the last few years, as we welcome new audiences, new players, people who didn't perhaps grow up with D&D. &D. Absolutely. And because of that constant influx of new players, we're always listening because we want to make sure that we're not only crafting play experiences and rules and stories that appeal to our longtime D&D &D fans, but that also are inviting to people who have just discovered D&D &D this week. And because of all of that listening, people can see that not only are we exploring new styles of play, like in The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, where suddenly you have an entire campaign where you can resolve just about every conflict in it nonviolently, but we're also refining how we present our monsters, how we design our spells. This is a living game, and it is an ongoing conversation with our community. And as a part of that conversation, the game continues to grow and evolve. And over the course of this panel, we're going to talk a bit about some of that growth and evolution. And this also connects to us exploring different formats. As Ray mentioned, we have new product formats coming. 
We have more adventure anthologies coming uh, as a part of our listening uh, to the audience. After coming out with Candlekeep Mysteries, we heard loud and clear people love shorter adventures that they can drop in and then, you know, a few evenings of play. More of that and so much more is on its way. Liz, is this this idea of finding new and innovative ways to engage with D&D something you're actively pursuing as you welcome these new audiences and as you find ways to to keep older players, I'm not going to say older players, um, veteran players engaged? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I think you'll probably hear a few themes threaded throughout the panel today. And uh, Ray and Jeremy both mentioned new product formats will be appearing in 2022. And you know, we really felt like the return of a few classic settings was the perfect time to experiment. Uh, you know, you're going to see uh, our goal has really been how do we make our products easier to use at the table? How do we introduce new play experiences for fans, both uh, veteran fans and our newer fans? Uh, and, you know, this is really we're exploring ways to create the best possible experience for players around the table. And uh, you'll see us experimenting and, you know, we're, we're kind of looking into ways that even technology can make your games easier to run and more fun for everyone to play. So uh, all of that is, uh, it, it, these are all things that we're looking at based on player feedback, based on our own experiences around the table. And uh, so, you know, some changes rolling out in 22 and, you know, you'll continue to see more and more of this as time goes on. Chris, what goes into ensuring that players at the table do have that great experience? Tying into what Jeremy said earlier about um, sort of paying attention to what our fans are saying, uh, what they're what they're looking for, uh, what they struggle with, with uh, uh, in terms of products we've released in the past. We, we pay attention to what they're saying and we try to refine our products accordingly, not just on the inside, but also in terms of how they're presented as uh, in packaging. So uh, if you've picked up the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, for example, you may notice that we've made some interior decisions. We've put some stuff in there that's designed to make that product for the DM more accessible and more digestible, as well as giving you tools and uh, other things that you can use to make actually running the adventure at the table an easier experience, um, particularly for, for DMs who don't run adventures th that are that big. Uh, we wanted to make it, even though it's a big adventure, feel like something that you can, you can handle and you can manage and you can adapt for your own needs and uh, help you internalize better all the information there with things like the story tracker that we put in and the guidance that we put in the introduction to help you as a DM understand what inf information is important to share with the players versus keep from the players, that kind of thing. But beyond the book, beyond the, the books, uh, we've also want to make the, the products just uh, different and varied and um, sort of tailor the packaging and the form factor to the product in question. And so even though we're known for making big hardcover books and the occasional box set, as um, my fellow panelists have already alluded to, you're going to see some things that are different from that, uh, where we present our products using different form factors in a different way, all designed to make them more digestible and accessible for their intended audience. And Chris, I'll just come back to you quickly. What, what can we look forward to? So as you said, you've kind of listened, you've made these changes. Is there anywhere in particular, anything in particular we should be looking out for? Is there anywhere where we can kind of uh, see a little bit more of what we can expect from, from the changes to how players experience this at the table? Yes, you're going to see a blog post coming out soon that will detail some of the changes that we've uh, already rolled out. Uh, with more to come in future posts. I can't wait. So do, of course, go and check that out on the website if you haven't already. I know we always throw a lot of information at you in these panels. Don't forget, 
you can always head by the website to check up on everything that we've said because i know even i can't fill out my little dnd secret notebook that fast now ray <laughs> i want to come to you because in 2024 we have a super exciting milestone coming up it is 50 yeah. years of D and D, and I think you know you can't imagine a more exciting milestone for such a unique, seminal game, can you? Really? So, what can we look forward to? Because I'm assuming it's going to be big. Fifty years, it's incredible, isn't it? And yes, it's going to be very exciting for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, one of them is I know there's been a lot of speculation about this, but uh, you know I can actually reveal today that we have earlier this year we began work on the next evolution of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, new versions of the core rule books, which will be coming out in uh, 2024 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, you know, you probably noticed, the fans noticed that we released uh, a bunch of surveys asking for feedback on various pieces of the player's handbook over the last year. And I know a lot of people were wondering what those were about. Well, this is what those were about. That's us beginning work on this, you know, this, this sort of, as I said, next evolution of the game. Uh, many thousands of people responded to those surveys. So we really, really appreciate that feedback. It's, uh, you know, again, that's one of the themes through the panel. We listen, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, doing the best to give you the version of the game that you really want. Um, so we can't really say much more yet about, you know, what, you know, what our plans are. We're still making them, uh, but you're going to continue to see more surveys like that. Um, Next year uh, is basically the timing will work out. So next year we'll have plenty to say about you know these new books and what they mean for D and D. Uh, we'll talk about how um, you know one one thing by the way I can assure you is these new versions of the books are going to be completely compatible with all those fifth edition products you already own and love and all the products were released between now and then. So don't panic there, but. Uh, you know, uh, next year we'll have lots more to say about the future of D and D. Uh, um, we'll talk not only about the new books, but about some cool new things we're doing in the digital arena to uh, deliver some exciting new uh, Dungeons and Dragons experiences. And uh, you know, again, probably most importantly, when we're ready to talk more about our plans next year, we'll have a lot more to say about how the fans can contribute and can help us shape this game into all that it can be. Ray, you have managed to master being both incredibly cryptic and yet incredibly exciting. I'm like, oh my God, I'm excited, but I don't know what for. <laughs> I try, yeah. Uh, all right, all right. Well, Liz, is there anything that you can tell me that's perhaps a little bit closer, a little bit more concrete, slightly less cryptic? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you asked because we have a new gift set coming in January. It is the D&D Rules Expansion gift set, and it's really the perfect way for DMs and D&D players, uh, you know, whether it's a gift or for yourself, uh, to really level up your library beyond the core rule books. Uh, so this set contains new printings of Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and a new volume called Morden Canaan Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. Uh, so this new volume collects tons of D&D material that we've released since the launch of 5th edition into one convenient tome. And there's also a Dungeon Master screen with all new art. And all of this is contained in a beautiful slipcase. So, you know, it's a gift set, which, of course, we would have loved to release it in time for the holidays. But you've probably heard that there are all kinds of challenges around the global supply chain. And uh, so we had our own challenges with production and shipping, which really forced us to delay the release until January 25th. But the good news is you can pre-order this now. And so go to your friendly local game store, uh, go to your favorite online retailer and pre-order this uh, set. Uh, you can plan to save up some of your holiday gift money perhaps to, uh, to give it to yourself or to someone, uh, a gamer that you love. Uh, so I, I can't emphasize enough how gorgeous these are gonna be. The traditional covers have an extra foil treatment and we've got this gorgeous alt version uh, that has all new cover art. So, uh, you know, these are just amazing sets uh, and it really gives fans a quick way to create a library of all of the setting agnostic material that they might want for their D&D games. Uh, we put all the expanded roles in one place. And if you've got 
uh, the core rulebook gift set and you add this new uh, rules expansion gift set, then you really have all of the foundational rules for the fifth edition of D&D. So it's, it's just a really handy way to build your library. I mean, it looks absolutely gorgeous. And weirdly, I kind of like that it's coming in January because January is that boring bit of the year, right? When I've, I've opened all my presents, we've had Christmas, you know, it's that bit when everything seems a little bit more dull. So I feel like it's quite nice yeah. to have something to look forward to, you know. So I think exactly. actually, yeah, January I can do. Jeremy, can you tell us a bit more about the content in this? Because we've seen what it'll look like. We've heard when it's coming. What can we expect on the inside? So fans are already going to be familiar with the content of Xanathar's Guide to Everything and Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. But yes, there is inside this gift set this new volume that Liz mentioned, Morden Kanan Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. And this book is a treasure trove of creature-related material that has appeared previously in other products for 5th edition, but are now all being brought together into one book and updated. We, as we wanted to create a single book that would be a sort of one-stop shopping of monsters and also playable races, which I'll get to in a moment, we thought, not only can we bring all of this into one place for this gift set, but we can also update some of this material because as Ray revealed, we're already working on our 50th anniversary plans, which will include those new versions of the core books. And as we're working on that update, we thought now's our opportunity to update some of the material that people can use now to already give a feel of where we're headed over the next few years with Dungeons and Dragons. And so as we gathered monsters uh, from various sources into Monsters of the Multiverse and also playable races, all of them have benefited from playtest feedback we've gotten over the last seven years. So we made improvements in clarity. We made, we've added new abilities. We've rebalanced things. We've made some of the material easier to, to digest at the game table. There's new art in this book as well as uh, familiar art. Uh, I think people are going to just be delighted to have over 250 monsters uh, in this book, and over 30 playable races. As far as I know, no D&D book has had, ever had as many playable races in one book before. And if people are curious, and I know they are, what those races are. These are all of the playable races we have published outside the player's handbook that are setting agnostic, meaning different playable options that are not tied to a particular D&D world but people rather who you can find anywhere in the multiverse and the multiverse. That's the theme of this book. As we, as we looked at not only the playable races, but the monsters, we wanted to make sure that everything presented here speaks to the multiverse as a whole. Uh, and so th this is a place where you can find folk and monsters, friends and foes, who you can encounter really in any world of the D&D multiverse, making this the perfect supplement for any of D&D's official settings, as well as for DM's homebrew settings. So there's a, it, it's a lot. Uh, this book, uh, we have been actually working on not only in tandem with our work for the 50th anniversary, but actually also in tandem with the other books coming out this year. So there are things that appear in The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, in Strixhaven, A Curriculum of Chaos, and in Fisben's Treasury of Dragons, all influenced by actually work we were doing on Monsters of the Multiverse. I sort of think of Monsters of the Multiverse as like the secret project we were working on all year that was uh, helping us as we also worked on all of the other books. So it's super exciting for me that we finally get to announce it uh, and people will be able to get their hands on this book uh, first in the gift set and then later on its own next year. It really does feel like 
everything's leading towards something, doesn't it? And and they stand alone. They are products that, you know, they have a specific purpose. You know, they'll definitely, whether you're looking to kind of build your world or, you know, whatever reason you're looking for to pick something up, these all have a very distinctive reason for existing. But it does feel like they are coming together. They are leading towards this kind of new iteration of D&D. And I have to say, that's the thing that gets me really excited. It always feels like there's something going on. I don't know, I have to say. But Chris, I'm going to come to you for our final question, because as I said, you know, it does feel like we're heading somewhere. So what do you what do you see coming for us in D&D in the next couple of years? What should we be looking out for? What are the highlights as we move into 2022 and beyond? Before I answer that, I'd like to skip back to my partner in crime, Jeremy, who um, I believe has some additional information to share about <laughs> Monsters of the Multiverse. That That's right, because uh, for this book, not only are we happy to announce it today, but I would actually love to show some pages from the book, uh, just so that people can see uh, some of the evolutions that await them uh, in this volume. So how about uh, to start, uh, we bring up the Bard. And what we're going to do is we're going to show you uh, the Bard NPC as the creature first appeared back in Volo's Guide to Monsters. And then you now see it uh, on the other side of the slide, the version of the Bard that appears in Monsters of the Multiverse. So first, you'll see new art. Uh, this delightful piece with this dragonborn Bard uh, uh, entertaining uh, their companions. But you're going to also notice some other things here, and this is going to be true in all of the slides that I show, that the stat block has changed. And also, uh, there's now a table over there uh, where the DM can roll to determine what is a particular NPC bard's uh, preferred performance type. Now, there are all sorts of interesting new things in this stat block. I'm not going to do a deep dive on this one. I'm going to wait to do that on one of the, the later pages I show. But what I'll point out right away is not only are there new abilities here, uh, but also the information has been uh, reorganized to make it easier for the DM to use. And we also have rebalanced all of these monsters so that they're, they are as resilient as they really should be uh, for their challenge rating. And when they're uh, meant to be a scary foe, they're going to be even scarier uh, in, in this new book. Let's look next at uh, a new version of the Warlock of the Great Old One. We see on the left when uh, this, this NPC first appeared in Volo's Guide to Monsters, uh, the, the poor Warlock had no art at all. But now uh, this NPC has this uh, wonderfully spooky piece of art as this warlock gazes off into the void uh, to draw on uh, the magic of their patron. And again, uh, if, if, you, if you look carefully at the text of, of each of these, you're going to see there are some pretty substantial changes uh, between these two uh, stat blocks the one that appeared some years ago in Volo's Guide, and now this new one that appears in Monsters of the Multiverse. Something else I can tell you about book organization uh, that is also new in Monsters of the Multiverse for our bestiary products, and that is we decided to alphabetize uh, the creatures throughout. So what that means is if you've ever found yourself in the situation of, ah, this adventure tells me to use a Glabrazoo, but you don't remember that in the, the monster manual that that demon is hidden in the demon section, and so you forget that you need to look for the G monster in the D section. Now G monsters are in the G section. It's a simple quality of life thing, but I think it's going to make a big difference when DMs are looking monsters up uh, during play uh, as well as during their prep. Let's look at one more. Uh, let's take a look now at the War Priest. Uh, I love showing pages from our, our beautiful books. So the War Priest on the left-hand side, again, bereft of art, but now in Monsters of the Multiverse, 
this gorgeous piece of art uh, showing this war priest uh, channeling divine power. Uh, you can see, like the new version of the bard, this war priest has a handy table for the DM to provide some new story texture. In this case, uh, the cleric uh, gets to have a different type of holy symbol uh, depending on the DM's role or the DM's choice because uh, the DM, of course, can always uh, just decide. Uh, and now we have, uh, again, a number of changes in the stat block. And here I want to pause and actually do a little digging. So first, if you compare sort of the before and after, you'll notice that the War Priest back in Volo's Guide to Monsters had this really chunky spellcasting trait. Lots of spells, fifth, uh, five levels of them, in fact, along with some regular attacks and a reaction. You'll notice that spellcasting trait uh, does not exist in the new version of the War Priest. Instead, the War Priest now has a spellcasting action uh, that is much slimmed down. And this is going to be a, a design theme that you'll see in all of our newer books, where we, listening to the community, as well as, as experiencing running our monsters ourselves, since we play and DM D&D so much, we discovered spellcasting monsters can sometimes require uh, a bit too much prep, uh, and sometimes you have to have a bunch of books open to figure out, okay, what spells uh, can this this NPC cast? We have slimmed down the spellcasting trait into a spellcasting action that really focuses on utility magic rather than combat magic, although as shown in this War Priest stat block, sometimes we we'll still sprinkle in some combat-relevant spellcasting. You'll also notice that the War Priest no longer uses spell slots, and that is also a common theme in our upcoming uh, NPC spellcasters, is we're no longer having DMs tracking spell slots. There's something else you're going to see here in this new War Priest, and that is this Holy Fire ability. Rather than squirreling away a spellcasting monster's heavy hitting, challenge rating, carrying damage abilities inside a spell list, we now make sure that if a DM doesn't even want to bother with the spells and just wants to use the regular actions in the stat block, we're now making sure that a spellcasting monster has a combination of regular actions that the DM can just read right there in the stat block that deliver the oomph that in the past would have been handled by the spellcasting trait, but are now being handled just by regular actions. And so that's what you see here with this holy fire action. And you'll see we also have sprinkled in uh, a little bit of magical uh, spice, even in this War Priest mall attack, because we, we want to make it as easy as possible for a DM to pick up and play with a stat block. We also want to make sure going forward that it's easy for a monster to hit at its CR level, because in some of our previous designs, it was often a little too easy, especially in a spellcasting monster, for a DM to pick a particular combination of spells, which would actually cause the monster's effective challenge rating to be far lower than the challenge rating printed in its stat block. And so what we're we have made what we've done really is to sort of guard the printed challenge rating so that it is much easier for a DM to run the monster the way it's presented and have that monster be the challenge that it was designed to be with still allowing there to be, particularly again in these spellcasting creatures, some fun utility options in the spell list that the DM can deploy in non-combat situations. Because monsters, and when we say monsters, we really just mean any DM-controlled creature, Monsters, of course, can be the adventurer's friends uh, just as often as they can be their foes. And so often the magic that appears in a stat block is there to help uh, the adventurers rather than to hinder them. So all of, all of these elements and far more uh, 
people are going to be able to find uh, when next year they get their gift set and open up Monsters of the Multiverse and really encounter what I, I expect will be some old friends, you know, these monsters, these playable races. It's like, oh, we've we've used these in our games over the last few years. But it, basically, your friends are going to now show up with a makeover. And I think I think groups are going to be delighted by uh, the improvements to playability, uh, the brand new abilities that give many of these playable races and these monsters an entirely different feel now at the table. I think this is going to be an exciting addition uh, to people's campaigns, especially when combined with the rules options that are also in Tasha's Cauldron and Xanathar's Guide. I mean, I think that's something I've really enjoyed, particularly this weekend, is looking at the ways that D&D is making the game accessible, making the game easier to pick up if you're a new player or perhaps a new DM, but still maintaining the feel of the kind of wonderful complexity that is the world of D&D and that kind of granular, detailed, you know, universe that you can dive into. I love the, as you said, the kind of quality of life improvements that just tweak so you can keep track a little bit better. You're perhaps a little bit less daunted if you're coming in for the first time, but it doesn't make the world any less magical, any less full. And I feel like that's really the theme of, of what we've seen in these new releases that we, in particular this weekend, have had a chance to have a sneak peek at. So thank you for that because, oh, who doesn't love new pages? Who doesn't love having a sneak peek in? And those looked absolutely beautiful. So Chris, I'm gonna come back to you. Hopefully you've had time as well now to think of a really great <laughs> final answer, but I'll come back to you and, and reiterate the question, which is, you know, just what for you are you looking forward to in the next couple of years? What should we be getting excited about, as I said, in 2022 and beyond? I'm, I'm a pretty good person to ask for this question because I exist in 2022 and beyond right now. Um, uh, the, the projects I'm working on now uh, will appear uh, in the future. And so as we look forward, um, you we can expect more adventure anthologies as Ray mentioned, um, another classic setting to return in, fairly soon um, next year, as Ray mentioned. Uh, plus, we're exploring two all new settings for future publication. These are settings that have never uh, been presented before to the D&D audience. Um, so this is the first time since we introduced Eberron in 2004 that we've gotten to be able to um, come up with uh, completely new settings. But they are in, they're in a stage that we call development. And it's important uh, for me to note um, that uh, we work on many things for future publication. But, uh, and many of these things aren't actually on our schedule. Uh, they're in development because we're in an exploration phase. We're sort of testing the viability of them. We're trying to figure out whether we can make real products out of them. And so we've got two settings that we're kicking around currently that are in this developmental exploration phase. And so maybe they'll see the light of day. I hope they will because they're both exciting concepts, um, but we're still working through that at this stage. Um, we're very excited, I must say, about the work we've done on them so far. Uh, and there's a lot to be excited about um, from beloved familiar settings uh, that we're doing to nostalgic content that we always um, uh, bring back uh, from the dead and uh, retooling that nostalgia for today's fan base, but also blending that nostalgia and those familiar settings with new stuff, with new ideas new concepts, new settings, new adventures in places we've never seen before. Uh, so what to look forward to in summary is sort of a blend of things that you know that we've done before and that we're good at doing and things that we've never done before uh, that we we're sure will excite you and will um, expand the D&D multiverse in ways you've never seen before. So now in the short term, in the very short term, uh, keep your ears open for uh, more news next month 
about a new product that we're releasing in 2022 that goes into a, a new place we've never been before. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, scary, um, uh, players are going to be absolutely terrified when they go into it, uh, setting <laughs> and, uh, um, and, uh, beyond that, uh, I can't say lots of secrets. <laughs> Always lots of secrets. Well, I know that you have one little secret that you're keeping for Sunny. <gasps> You've got something oh, that you're working yes. on for 2022, and I want to see it. So please okay. share. Share All just right. one secret. Okay. Uh, yes. So um, let's see it. I'll, let's see it. Just let's pop it up there. Okay. So <laughs> this is a very loose sketch <laughs> of a cover that uh, one of our artists, Hydro74, who many of you know and love because he does many of our alt covers, uh, turned over just days ago. And so um, this, is, this is going to be an alt cover for a book uh, in a product that we'll see in 2022. Uh, what you're looking at <laughs> is a hamster. In, in case you, in case you didn't know that already, and as as you know, Al, <laughs> hamsters are the most dangerous mammal in the animal kingdom. And of uh, so, uh, whatever this product may be, it's got this figure on the front. And those who don't know the old Baldur's Gate video games very well might not recognize that this is actually one of our most famous D and D characters. This is Boo, the miniature giant space hamster. And now I know you're going to ask, so I'll just answer right away. What is the difference between a miniature giant space hamster and a regular hamster? None. They're the same thing. Um, so Boo, Boo will be coming back in 2022 in a secret, top secret product that I'm working on now with a bunch of other folks on the team. And I can't wait for you to see um, Boo and his friends in this mystery product next year. Well, what a way to finish up D&D &D celebration. <laughs> Did anybody have bets on Boo coming back? Did anybody <laughs> think that was how we were going to see things out? But actually, as it turns out, I can't imagine a better way to finish off this fantastically wacky, wonderful <laughs> weekend that we have had. So, I mean... Uh, I love the future of D&D &D panel. I, you know, I've said throughout it, it is so exciting to me. I, I totally switch back into just a D&D &D fan desperate to find out secrets. And I feel like we got some there. I know we're going to have everybody on social media immediately deconstructing everything that's been said, zooming in on those <laughs> images, deconstructing the sketch of Boo, I'm sure. So lots to delve into there and lots to look forward to. But as ever, I am so thrilled to have been your host for the future of D&D. &D. What a wonderful panel. We've got so much to be excited about thank you so much to ray liz chris and jeremy for joining us here for this so this is it we're at the end we're almost there but we're going to have a little wrap up we're going to talk about some of the highlights we're going to celebrate how much fun we've had over the last couple of days so i will see you right back here after a very quick break <laughs> thanks al thanks al bye bye